dead, he's surely alive and he's living on the inside, roaring like a lion, my God's not dead, he's surely alive and he's living on the inside, roaring like a lion, my God's not dead, he's surely alive and he's living on the inside, roaring like a lion. Welcome to Living Hope. For those of you who have never joined us before, we just want to welcome you into our family, into our community. This is a place built on relationships. We strive to be a church where people do not have to do life alone. We seek to have strong relationships not only with one another, but of course with our Heavenly Father, with our God. And so we come together not just on Sunday mornings, but we come together throughout the week and we serve this community the best that we can. And we also meet together in life groups and try to grow in our faith with one another. This morning, you guys all should have received one of these cards in your bulletins. If you did not, please uh, see the ushers afterwards. But uh, this is just a way for you guys to access your giving statements as we've just started a new year, your giving statements from last year. So take a look at that. It's got instructions. Um, if you have trouble, you can go ahead and contact one of us, and we can help you out. But as we jump back into worship, as we continue to sing out praises to our God, let's be reminded that the Scripture tells us that Jesus Christ has a living water. And we all have that living water inside of us if we have accepted that claim that Jesus Christ is God. That living water is the Holy Spirit. So right now as we sing, we're going to sing this song called All My Founds. We've done it here before, but it's been a little while. And it talks about that living water, that living water that gives life. Would you join us in singing some more? So 
power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead. The same power lives in us, Lord. Help us to remember that always. Help us to remember that we trust in you if we believe in you. That we have eternal life, that we have the power of your Holy Spirit within us to help us, to guide us, to teach us as we continue to grow in our relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning. I wanted to be able to take just a few minutes with you, and <clears throat> excuse me, if, if you are new to Living Hope today and you're a guest with us for the first time, I want to say welcome to you first and foremost, and uh, to make sure that we're glad that you're here this morning. Uh, the second thing is I want to take uh, like a, just a couple of minutes to do some housekeeping items. Freddie, I'm just feeling a little hot up here, if you could turn me down just a touch, I'd appreciate that. Um, we don't normally do this, so if you're a guest with us today, this is not in our, our normal flow of what we do on a, on a Sunday morning, but th this is the best way to uh, get to talk to the family, so to speak. And uh, so I wanted to talk to you about a few things to catch you up with. And uh, it's 2017 already. January is half over today. <sighs> And we just feel like we're getting going, don't we? But a couple of things that I wanted to catch you up on is, is first, to give you a report on hope for the holidays as to what, as to what is going on, what has been going on. And uh, you helped 13 families have a Christmas like they haven't either been able to experience before or in a very long time. And as close as, as we can come, this is not an exact dollar, but, but uh, for the tags that were on the Christmas tree, the ones that you picked up, the ones that you fulfilled and brought back to us that we were able to give out, along with the cash donations that you gave for families of hope for the holidays that you gave to the tune of around $12,000, as close as we can figure. So I want to, yes, give yourselves a hand for that. I want to thank you for that. Of that money, uh, close to $5,000 was given towards medical expenses for families. And as many as you know, of you know, may know that, that medical expenses, that, that you helped families in such a way with medical expenses that would have taken them years to get out from underneath. And I am just, I am so proud of you guys. I'm so proud of what we do as a church. I want to make sure that, that we, we celebrate these things together. Uh, as I was talking with our leadership team, that, that I get so busy sometimes and so caught up into the, all right, all right, we, this one's done, so I, I get on to the next one because I want to do a good job on the next one. We all want to do a good job on the next one. And sometimes we forget, and I forget, that we need to just slow down and celebrate what God is doing amongst us. So you were able to do that uh, $5,000 in medical expenses uh, for people that uh, were really, really needing a boost. Uh, we gave a car to a family uh, as, as part of that. And, and we got two, two notes back that I wanted to read to you as to notes back to Living Hope, the Living Hope family. The first one was this, Christmas is not always easy for me. Sometimes it's hard to find the joy in it all. Thank you so much for giving us some hope and showing me what the true meaning of Christmas is. I will never forget this, and I promise I will pay it forward. That's awesome. Another one was this. Again, I want to say how much this means to me. Your church has shown me nothing but God's love since we started attending there. We're so grateful for, to him and to your congregation for the blessing that is being given to us. Okay. Some of these families are Living Hope families that we were able to help. Some are families in the area of Madison. So I want you to be able to walk with pride that Living Hope bands together to help families out. Another thing that we wanted to uh, talk about, or at least I wanted to update you with, that, that if you were here uh, in November and, and uh, we did our Blessed Life series, if you were a part of that, and, and some of those stories have been able to, been starting trickling back to me, and another one that we talked about, but I wanted to give you a little bit of statistical updates with that, that I don't want this, or even the Blessed Life series, to just get caught in the muck and the mire of it, well, it's just all about money. That's not really where it adds, but where it is, but it's an indication of what God is doing in the hearts and the minds of the people at Living Hope. That over that time, in the period of November and early December, that giving on a weekly basis, your tithes, your trusting God with all of that he has given to you, was up 40% over normal 
offerings of what we did during that time. Um, that's just a huge thank you. Not, on, not only for us that, that are doing the books and things, but, but the stories that are going along with that. Now, I don't have permission to tell this particular story, but, but it's, a, it's about a family that decided to trust God by starting to tithe. And there's a, there's a backstory that when they did that, this happened, okay? Now, it's not a if you tithe, it's the lottery, okay? We, we talked about that in the series, and I want to I make sure that we're on with that. But you should see the blessing and the way God is working through lives, not just financially, but by trusting God. Taste him and see if he is not good. I wanted to update you on that, that, that with our giving through the year uh, from a budgetary standpoint, that we were running a little behind on our, uh, we, we project what we think God has put before us from an income standpoint, and that's how we judge our expenses. And uh, with, with your giving through the end of the year, that, that we're just about caught up to our, to our budgetary standard for giving each and every week to uh, what God is fulfilling in ministry here. And that's because of you. That's with you that we are getting to do this. And so I'm excited with that. I want you to, to keep up the good work and to challenge God and to see what he's going to do. On the back side of that, like I mentioned, there's a story that goes along with that. If you have a story of your family as, as maybe you've decided to either start tithing for the first time in your life or you decided to, to do something different, how is that playing out for you? How is God coming back to you? Is it, is it joy in your life? Are, are you seeing things happen? Are you, what, what is going on? I would love to hear those stories. We would love to get some of these stories recorded down. Because you'll, if you remember in that Blessed Life series, that's what that book was. That book was a collection of, of their experiences together and how God has helped them in the way that they never thought possible before. So thank you for doing that. That's another exciting time uh, for us in the lives of uh, us being together in the church. And the third one that I want to talk to you about is, is uh, about our volunteers. Now, some of you were there, a lot of you were there, because last Monday night we had over 70 volunteers meet at the coffee shop for a time of, of training and, and just getting together and to, to get to know one another. And that was fabulous. I had a great time. I hope that you did too. If you didn't, if you didn't make the meeting or weren't able to make the meeting, uh, we're working towards trying to put a video together for that so that if you want to catch up with what's going on in our, in our volunteers and in the life of the church of how we can serve back. And uh, as we staff want to serve you as well, but as you volunteers serve in a capacity in the church, what is that going to look like? What's, what does that look like? And something that I, I want to maybe help clarify a little bit um, that the standard that was talked about, or the, the, uh, the goal that we are, we are all about, is, is the same goal that was started when Living Hope was founded. And that was that, that we hope that our people will arise to the goal of serving during a service for those that, that uh, are attending a service and then attend a service. Now, I, I realize there's is serve one, attend one. That's, that's not a new concept for us. But we realized after Monday night that maybe it had been messaged a little differently than we had hoped it was going to be messaged and, and that there are people that have kids. I remember what it was like. Do you remember what it was like to have a two-year-old, a five-year-old, an eight-year-old, something like that? Um, God helps me put those memories away. But, uh, but uh, do you are you there? Do you remember that time? You remember how hard that made life <laughs> during that time? But what a blessing that time was. Well, that got, that got put into the message and, and maybe wasn't clarified as much as we had hoped that that was going to be clarified. And, and it led to some, uh, some misunderstandings, so to speak, as to what, what does it mean to, to serve one and worship one and how is that going to affect me? And, and we want you to know, I want you to know as your pastor, that that is our goal. That all things being equal, we hope that you would serve in the gifts that God has given to you for an hour where, where people need help. And then we hope that you would take this, uh, this, uh, either this hour or the next hour to be able to worship because that's important for your soul. As you may know, if you're gone from church for several weeks, how, how does that affect the condition of your soul? How does that affect the condition of, of who you are and what's going on? And that's an important piece is to be able to worship together. Now, the overarching thing that we want to make sure we know is that 
We don't want to destroy either one. We don't want to destroy what's going on in our families. We want to help and to walk along with you in those areas. So I am hoping that, that if, if there are misconceptions out there, if there are potholes that we didn't cover up that, that maybe is a specific situation, that we can work together, that we want to work together for the good of you, and we are trusting that you want to work together for the good of not only the staff but of the church more importantly. So, so I'm hoping and encouraging that we can do this together and that uh, we can conversationalize uh, together to, to not weaken the goal that we have but to be able to make it work with the life that we are living in. Does that sound all right with, with, with you? Uh, I, I hope that it does, and uh, we're going to move on forward with that. But we are encouraged. Monday night was a great encouragement to see all of the people that are volunteering. And if you're not volunteering or serving in some capacity of the church, I want to encourage you to do that. There, there, there is nothing quite like what you get back by giving. Those of you that do it, understand it. Those of you that don't do it yet, we want to encourage you to do that in the same way. So thank you for letting me take a little bit of time to, to catch you up with some things and to, to move us down the road with a, a few other things. And, and once again, let me be one to welcome you to church, to the family this morning. Thanks. I will now fulfill this banana's destiny. Born in the jungles of Guatemala, braving Arctic blasts and marauding elephants, shipped halfway around the world, and now its destiny fulfilled to be consumed by me. Enjoy this banana, for this is what you were made for. This is why you were placed on our blue planet. Here at the end of your life, you may look back without regret, for you were made for me, and in you, I am well pleased. Enter into the joy of your master. I know where that banana is entering in the next 24 hours, and it ain't joy. Fulfilled bananas. Klonix got them, others don't. <laughs> now, I like a banana split too, but I don't think I've ever talked to a banana split like that before. <laughs> Have you? Have you ever talked to your food that way? In the destiny that it is about to fulfill. Now let's be extra honest for just a moment and talk about the purpose in our own lives. Do, do we talk about the purpose in our own lives that way, in a destiny fulfilled? We've come to the new year, 2017, with no idea what's in store for us. It's as if we took the pieces of 2016 and put them back in the box and we're pulling off the shelf the box of 2017. Did 2016 leave you with feelings of pride and well-being? Or did maybe 2016 leave you with wanting more? Well, if you're feeling like an outsider, maybe at a, at a party where everybody else knows the inside joke, is that, is that how 2016 left you? Well, I want to encourage you today as we step into 2017. That we all have times in our lives when we feel this way, but I, I, think, I think it's time that we do something about it. I think it's time that we, that we start to move with purpose and direction and intention for our own lives and for God's church. That's what we're going to do today and in the next couple of weeks as we talk about this. But, but in a national survey, a survey that was taken in 2016, 18 to 24-year-olds report that having a clear purpose in life is a big part of being a real adult. The problem is most young people don't feel like they've found that sense of purpose. More than 86% of young adults say that making decisions in line with their purpose makes them an adult, according to this national survey. But only 43% say that they have a clear picture of what they want in life. 36% say that their career path aligns with life purpose. And only 30% know why they are actually here. Christine Weldon, a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, concludes that this study is not good news. Coasting is existing, not thriving. The majority of young people who say they don't have a clear picture of what they want in life also say that they're existing, not thriving, while those with purpose more often say that they are thriving. So a question for you today is, is are you merely coasting and existing in life? Or are you thriving 
in the reason that God has prepared for you and the reason that God has put you here on this big blue planet. Let's take a look at somebody in the Bible that I think gives us some clear principles of why God has us here, what he wants to do with us, and, and what maybe even our response should be to that. You see, this young girl's name is Esther. And if you have ever seen Veggie Tales, you probably know the story of Esther. Or if you have kids, you, you, need, to, you need to catch up on the Veggie Tales version. It's a great version. But, but for us today, we're going to take a look at Esther, I think, in, in possibly a new way. For you see, Esther comes from a family, a very important family, that uh, all that we know about Esther, we don't know... Esther exactly, and her history is a little bit, uh, uh, we, we don't have a great history, but we have a great history of her family. You see, Esther was part of the Israelite nation, part of the Jewish population, and at this time we're, we're, we're told that they are in, the land of Judah is, is taken captive, so they're not even getting to live in their homeland. They are living in exile somewhere. Israel was at one time favored by God, and, and life for Israel was thriving. They had God walking before them and with them into this promised land years and years ago. God was telling them in person that no matter where you put your foot, that is the land I am going to give you. Some awesome and great gifts from God. Some awesome and great responsibilities with God along the way. But as often happens, and it probably happens the same for you and for me, is that, that as life goes on, Okay, as, as the generations pass, sometimes the truck goes off the road a little bit and maybe goes into the ditch. That's where we find Esther at a, this course of time in history where Judah is not at home. They are in captivity. Esther is in captivity. And they are split into two groups. Even the Jews are. There's Israel and there's Judah. And, and they've both got their issues. And that's not the background that I want to focus on today. But, but let's start the story at the beginning, okay? If you have your Bibles along with you, if you have your, your tablets, your electronic devices, whatever you may have, let's turn to the book of Esther in the Old Testament and let's read together. It'll also be on the screen. So you can follow along in the YouVersion app if you have that. Uh, there's the Wi-Fi password, uh, guest Wi-Fi, if you need to to do that, to follow along too. But let's get into Esther chapter 1, verse 1. Words for a new year. Now is your time. You see, this is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces, stretching from India to Kush. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all of his nobles and officials. The military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. For a full 180 days, that's six months, for a full six months he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and the glory of his majesty. When these days were over, the king gave a banquet. So they got done with the party and had the after party. And this after party was just a mere seven days long in an enclosed garden in the king's palace for all of the people from the least to the greatest who were in the citadel of Susa. The garden had hangings of white and blue linen fastened with cords of white linen and purple material to silver rings on marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. Are you starting to get this in your mind? Close your eyes if you have to and, and start to envision what this is looking like. Wine was served in goblets of gold, each one different from the other. The royal wine was abundant, in keeping with the king's liberality. Liberality, yeah, that word. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions, for the king instructed all of the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. Wow. Any of you see a movie called uh, uh, Animal House? Okay, if you've ever seen that movie, those boys partied, right? Well, let me tell you, King Xerxes would put Animal House to shame. For six months, the wine flowed, it says, and there were no inhibitions to what was going on. And then after that party, another party for another week happened for everybody in the kingdom. What would that be like? Let's just tomorrow, everybody call in, and we're taking six months off to get together and party for six months over at the Williamses. 
So, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell them that we were coming, but. Uh, now, Queen, the Queen Vashti is, was her name at this time. She also gave a party. Now, I want to take just a break here for just a minute, and guys, I want to kind of talk to you that uh, we see here the kind of party that King Xerxes threw, and, and we see, and, and I know some of you with uh, the type of party that I think you would throw, and uh, it would be a good time, wouldn't it? It'd be a great time. Now, if your wife threw a party, what kind of a party would that be? That party would be a little more refined. That party would be a little more subtle. That party would probably be a little better put together and all of those things. So the queen had her own party going on at the same time. But if, if you were there, what would that look like? Now, the Bible doesn't tell us specifically, but what it does tell us is that, that King Xerxes called for the queen towards the end of one of these parties. If you've been partying for six months, what's your state of mind? Okay, get that in your head too. And if the king is calling for Queen Vashti to come, I don't know, it doesn't tell us exactly what the motives or the methods were. We're going to assume that they were pure, but we can know that Queen Vashti was probably a looker, okay? She was probably not bad looking at all, and she was probably refined as the queen. And so for whatever reason the king called for her, she said, no, I'm not going. I, I, I kind of assume that she probably knew what he was up to or something of that nature, but she refused to come. Now, if you know anything at all about kingdoms and kings and queens, that, that if the queen refuses to come to see the king, what's going to happen? It's probably not going to be good. So the king is furious, as we would all understand. And what the king does is he gets his advisors together and he says, what are we going to do? What should I do with this queen that won't obey what I'm telling her to do? Well, you see, they get together, the nobles and, and, and his advisors get together and they think, you know what, you should probably kick her out. You should probably get a new queen, one that maybe will listen a little better. Okay, uh, that's that time, not today, but, but uh, we can go along with that. So what he does is he kicks Queen Vashti out, never to be seen by the king again. We don't know what happens to her. He just uh, says that she was not to be in his presence ever again. We are going to assume the best that she just moves out somewhere else. So now what is the king to do? The king is without a queen in the kingdom. What am I going to do? And if you know the story at all, you find out that the king is going to hold a beauty pageant. A beauty pageant for the ages of who is going to be queen of the kingdom. All right, how many of you want to be in that beauty pageant? Uh, okay. <laughs> but what the king ordered was that the, the, his people were to go out throughout the land to find all of the beautiful young ladies of the land, bring them back into the harem of the king, get them ready, and we're going to have a beauty pageant for the ages of all these young women. And Esther, this Jewish girl Esther, is one of these girls It was taken to be in the king's harem. Along with many of the other girls that were brought there at this time. Now, now don't take me wrong, this is, this is a great honor for them, but, but you see, this wasn't exactly a volunteer type of a thing of who wanted to sign up, that, that they came throughout the land, they, they encouraged the girls to come with them. And Esther found favor with someone named Haggai. And because of this, Esther was placed in a favorable, a favorable position in the harem. You see, this, this person saw that she had beauty, but there was something different about this girl named Esther. And so Haggai puts her in a better position. He saw that she had beauty treatments, that she had special food better than any of the rest of the harem. Apparently, it was better than just the ordinary quality. Esther was given seven maids to serve her. They went into the harem at least 12 months before they ever went in to go see the king. That's, that's wild to me. When I, when, I, when I sit down and study this, that, that who gets ready? Guys, listen to this. If your wife was getting ready for a date, okay, this girl took a year. So however long it takes your wife to get ready, that's nothing. Just relax. It's going to be okay. But it says for six months she was treated with oil and myrrh. And for the other six months she was treated with perfumes and cosmetics. 
Think about that. Twelve months. One year to get ready for the biggest beauty pageant of your life. How during the six months, Esther was, however, not alone. She wasn't just taken from her home to the king's house. She was close by with, with her cousin, and his name was Mordecai. Mordecai had raised her as if he, she was his own daughter uh, because her parents had died years earlier, and, and we see that Mordecai was, was watching out for her, and, and Mordecai was, was one that served at the king's gate and, and uh, had, a, had a place around the kingdom, and, and uh, so Mordecai was around. At least she had her cousin Mordecai there to hang out with. Now, the Bible in chapter 2 says this. When the turn came for Esther to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's unit, who was in charge of the harem, suggested. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. She was taken to King Xerxes. Now, the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead <coughs> Of Vashti. Now, to put this all into perspective, let's let's get uh, caught up here that that uh, we have a small town girl living in a lonely world, and she took the midnight train going anywhere. If you know the name of the song, that's good for you. But that's not, not really what happened. But but uh, she did take the train to the king's house, and goes on to win the favor and the queen of the land. Now, I want to get this a little bit perspective before we move on. I want to set the stage, the foundation of where we are at, okay? We have, a, we have a group of people that are not living in their homelands. This queen is taken out of obscurity and put into the limelight. The queen of the land that ruled over 127 providences, stretching from India to Kush. Historians estimate that in 480 B.C., of, of when we think this, this happened, the empire had some 50 million people living into it. Okay, that's a huge amount of people living in this kingdom. That's roughly 44% of the entire population of the world of that time. That's a big deal. That is a huge deal. Let's not lose the size and the impact of the story. It's not just a, a subset story somewhere in the corner that's just good for children and everywhere. But put, your, put yourself in Esther's place for just a moment. You're living in a small town, maybe even the size of Madison, I don't know. But all of a sudden, someone asks you to come, move into the big house, and be a part of this international beauty pageant. Do you do it? Even if you're not forced, do you do that? Do you take a step out of your comfort zone to what you could possibly see before you, but it's not guaranteed? It's just an idea. How does that relate to you today? Is there something inside of you that feels like maybe, just maybe, you were made for something more than you're doing right now? That maybe, just maybe, there's something more for you out there that you're not seeing right now. That there's a purpose in your life that is being covered up that we don't get to see right now. Now back to Esther's story for just a minute. The next couple of chapters uh, are, uh, uh, there's a couple more characters that, that have a subplot to the story. One is Mordecai, Esther's cousin. The other is Haman. We are introduced to Haman. Haman was given a great seat of honor into the kingdom, and he had the king's ear, and he was on the king's staff. And whenever Haman would walk by the king's gate, everyone would bow down as he walked by. How cool would that be? That when you walk down the street of Madison, everybody just kind of kneeled down beside. Wouldn't that be fun to have that kind of authority and power? What would that do to us inside if we had that kind of authority and power? Because I think the same thing happened to Haman that would happen to us. Because you see, there was one man by the king's gate that would not bow down when he walked by. And his name was Mordecai. And when Mordecai would stand there and Haman would walk by, that would anger Haman. Haman not only had a dislike for Mordecai, Haman wanted to kill Mordecai. 
And I think some of us would feel the same way if that happened, and, and that's just a sideline story for right now. But, but I want you to understand that there's something brewing in the midst, that there's something that's not right in the kingdom, and that Mordecai, this Jew, this one that won't follow in line, this one that won't do what exactly everybody else is doing, oh, boy, that's going to cause trouble. Now, the one thing that Haman didn't understand was that Queen Esther, he didn't know that Queen Esther was Mordecai's cousin. He didn't know that Queen Esther was a Jew. Now, there are things that start to get really interesting in this story as, as Mordecai finds out about Haman's plan and he talks to his cousin, Esther. And it's at this point that, that Esther's life, that, that Mordecai helps her understand maybe why, just why she was placed in the king's court at this time for this reason and what is she going to do about it. Listen to what happens. In Esther chapter 3, we jump to, then Haman said to King Xerxes, there is a certain people dispersed among the peoples in all of the providences of your kingdom that is, remember, millions and millions strong, who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all of the other people, and they do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let the decree be issued to destroy them, and I will give ten thousands of Talent, thousands of talents of silver to the king's administrators for the royal treasury. You see, if you let me kill these Jews, I'll pay you. So the king took a signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, the enemy of the Jews. Keep the money, said the king to Haman, and do with the people as you please. News out of Washington, D.C. Open season on any Wesleyans across the country. What are you going to do? How are you going to feel about that? And where does it go from there? Mordecai asked Queen Esther to do a relatively simple thing. Just talk to the king. Get him not to do this. You are in a position and a place where, where all you have to do is just, just talk to him. The king can make this decision go away. This king can, can make this decision not valid. Sounds easy, right? But you have to understand that, that unless the queen is called into the king's court, if she just shows up in front of the king and he thinks, no, this is the right time for that, she could be killed instantly on the spot. It's not like when we get to walk into someone else's office that we can freely walk in and out. My wife can walk into my office at any given time because she's my wife. What would that be like, guys, if your wife walked into the room and Unless you gave her the thumbs up, she had to be gone. Let's not test that, shall we? I don't, <laughs> I don't have that kind of time in my counseling appointments for that. But Queen Esther, just like you and just like me, Queen Esther was unsure about what she should do next. Should she really truly put her life on the line? You might be asking yourselves that very question as 2017 is just getting out of the gates and something in the back of your mind, something that God is maybe inspiring you to is telling you to get out of the gates, take a step, go for the risk. Now, I'm, I'm hoping that, that your step that God is prompting you to take does not lead to life or death, but I hope it leads to uncovering your purpose. I hope that it leads to, to uncovering who God truly made you to be in your purpose in 2017. Queen Esther is unsure about the next step to take, what to do about it. She sends word to her cousin Mordecai and, and essentially says, you know, I, I'm not sure I could do this. Just like us sitting here today, I get it. But listen to Mordecai's response. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. You see, if they find out that Esther is a Jew, they can kill her as well. For if you remain silent at this time, here's the important part. Relief and de deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your family's father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. Who knows? Maybe you were put on this planet in Madison, South Dakota at Living Hope Church at nine something in the morning for such a time as this. Or do you think that you go through life just making decisions however you want to make them? 
that there's nothing else going on around, that, that the spiritual life that we have wrapped around us all the time plays a part in where we are. Through some soul-searching and encouragement from her cousin Mordecai, Queen Esther does just that. She goes and she talks to the king. She goes beyond herself. She goes outside of her comfort zone. She's willing to put her own life on the line for her people, for what's right to do. Through the, through a, the next piece of the story, the Jews are, are not saved necessarily, but... What happens because a king cannot take back what he's already decreed. So the decree is out there that it's open season on the Jews. But what the king can do is this, that that he can also put out a second decree that says, you know what, okay, it's open season on on June 14th, it's open season on the the Jews. That's all cool, but they get to defend themselves. (laughs) That kind of changes the story up again a little bit, doesn't it? That That kind of puts the rifle in the hands of the deer as much as it does the hunter. That puts the shotgun on the the laser-guided missiles on the feet of the pheasants as it does the hunters. That would change the game up a little bit, wouldn't it? And that's exactly what happens. You see, on these days, everybody got a little less excited about trying to kill a Jew at that time because of the courage, because of the placement, because of the training, because of where God had put Esther for such a time as this. As we approach and, and get into the rhythm of 2017, I wonder if God doesn't have you, if God doesn't have me, if God doesn't have us in this place at this time for such a time as this. Something that I want you to, to put down in your story, if you've got your note-taking guides or following along in your version app, you can, you can see that these points are there. But for the sake of time, I'm going to give you the three basic principles that I want us to understand as we walk into 2017. And the first one is this. You were placed for such a time as this. Esther was placed in the kingdom for such a time as this. The second one is this, that she and you are being prepared for such a time as this. Esther spent 12 months without seeing the king to get ready for that moment that she was going to go in and talk to the king. And then beyond that, as queen, she was being prepared for such a time as this. Mordecai was in her life. Who's your Mordecai? Who's the, who's the Mordecai in your life that walks alongside of you and encourages you and says, you know, you can do this. As your pastor, I want to be that. You can do this. I know you can do this. I've gotten to talk to some of you one-on-one about your hopes, your dreams, your desires, and your purpose in life. And yep, it's scary. But you can do this. We are here together to do this. The third thing is this, that just like Esther, you are being prompted for such a time as this. We've got to get beyond and past the times when we tell ourselves, well, maybe, maybe later. Maybe one day. I love that one. Maybe one day. For you see, one day never shows up. Tomorrow I will do that. Tomorrow never gets here. It's always today. The story of Esther is true today. Just as it was back then. Because I see that there's a very close correlation between Esther and her people and you and I here today. You see the culture's changing, ladies and gentlemen. Times, they are a-changing. And we are here for such a time as this that if no one is going to step up and champion the family, who's going to do it? If no one is going to stand up and champion the importance of a relationship with God, then who's going to do it? If no one is there to tell people that it doesn't matter what you do tomorrow, God will not love you any less, who's going to tell them that? It doesn't matter what you do tomorrow. God cannot love you anymore. Who's going to tell them that? I get a chance to tell a segment of the population right here during this time. But tomorrow or Tuesday at work, who's going to tell them that? I hope that you'll step into that. Because to just talk to somebody might cost us a little bit of fame and fortune, but it's surely not going to cost us our life. Not here in America. Now, if you want to go over to Nepal with Nathan in a few weeks, one, you need to get your money in today. But two, as you are there and you get into some of those other countries, you do start to make an impact. You do start to take a chance. You do start to put your life on the line. 
with something. I don't think that exists in Madison. I think there are places that we could take you in this country that it would start to make an impact and it would start to matter between life and death, but that, I don't think that that's here. If you and I follow after Christ, we're being groomed for the king's court. We are in a land that we wish we were not in. You see, if you are a Christ follower, you have a hope and a wish and a dream for a life in heaven, do you not? I hope that you do, but we are not currently living in the land that we wish we were living in. So what are we going to do when we are captive in a sin-filled world until that day when Christ returns again to come for those that believe in him and we will get to live for eternity with them? That's the day we hope for, we are looking towards. But until that day arrives, we are here. Let's make the best of it. Let's, let's uncover why God has created you and I for such a time as this. Where is it that God has placed you at this time? I hope that in your mind right now that the, that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God is working at your mind and your heart and something is prompted on you that, that on Tuesday or Thursday or Saturday, hmm, who should I talk to? That person is on your mind right now. You need to follow through with that. I want to encourage you with that because you were placed at this time, just like Mordecai called Esther, that if you choose not to, that doesn't mean you sideline the movement of what God is doing. That just means that he's going to do it a different way. Do you really want to be left out of that? Do you really want to be on the sidelines of the biggest game in all of history? But you have to be prepared. So how is God preparing you? What has he put on your path? I'm going to call the band up at this time as we get ready, because as we talk about being at this place at this time and, and being prepared, and, and who is God prompting you? Who is God, how is God prompting you to act, to prepare yourself and to get ready? Let me take you to the words of Paul, the, the words of Saul into Paul, into Ephesians, that he told the church, he wrote a letter to the church that I believe is for all of us. Ephesians 4.1 says, I urge you, I'm begging you, I'm encouraging you, whatever you need, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Each and every one of us, you and I have received a calling from God. Are you living up to it? Or are you hoping somebody else picks up the ball and runs with it? Let us do this. Not just because it's January, not just because it's a new year, but because we are followers after God. And that is what we are here to do, is to help, to encourage, to walk. Further on in our studies, we're going to talk about, because we're going to talk about being a disciple. Being a disciple is not an instantaneous thing that happens. To start learning how to be a disciple is something that instantaneously starts to happen. But to be a truly conformed, mature disciple in Christ is a long-run game. And we're seeing a culture develop around us that's all about the microwave society, that we want it now, we want it here, we want it instantaneous. I don't want to go through the steps of having to learn all of this through years and years and years. Mr. Williams didn't learn to build a house overnight. It took him years of practice and years of pride and years of doing it right. Lawrence, you didn't learn to work on airplanes and be a machinist overnight. It took years of being in the right place at the right time with the right purpose and the right willingness to learn what God wants to teach you. God created me to help others become more to become more in Christ. That is why God has me on this planet. That's why I am here today at this place, at this time, for this people. Why did God create you? Seek after that. If you have that question, you, uh, you come talk to me. I don't know if it's going to happen Wednesday, February 1st or Tuesday, but sometime in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to start a group on one night. I think it's going to either be a Tuesday or a Wednesday night. Coffee and conversation. We've built a great coffee shop by a bunch of great volunteers that put that thing together, and we're going to use it. Whether you like coffee or not, we'll find something for you. But we're going to meet together here, and I'm going to, I, I teach a class called ethos. Ethos is the Greek word for character. God wants to refine and build his character inside of each and every one of us. And I'm going to help you discover that. I'm not going to create your character. I'm just going to help you brush off the extras 
You ever talk to a sculpture that, that, that takes a piece of marble and, and chips it away and, and people ask him, well, how did you get this beautiful sculpture out of that ugly blank of marble? He says, I didn't. It was there all the time. All I had to do was chip off the rough edges, right? You heard that before? Put up that next scripture on the screen for me, would you? This is a, a benediction that I want to get to you, and then we're going to go into communion. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. God has a purpose in your being right where you are. Christ, who indwells in you by the power of His Spirit, wants to do something in you and through you. Believe this and go in His grace, His love, and His power in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to enter now into a time of communion. We're going to do it a little bit different. I have two stations up here. Oh, I almost forgot. Perhaps this is the moment for which you were created. This is going to hang in our coffee shop because I don't want us to forget. I don't want us to forget that God loves each and every one of you. And God wants to have a personal relationship with you. And I want to offer that up to you this morning. That if you do not have a personal relationship with you, or maybe you need to just reinvest in who God is in your life, I want to give you that opportunity right now. I want you to pray with me, if you would. If you'd, if you'd close your eyes with me and just, and just put yourself into a time of prayer and preparation, as, even as we head towards communion. God, I feel your prompting upon my life for this time at this place. And if there are those that wish to start a relationship with you this morning, God, would you please inspire them? Raise your hand if you want that so we can pray with you. Is that what you want this morning? Do you want to reinvigorate your walk with Christ this morning? Is that you? Do you want to raise your hand for that? Do you want a, do you want a new fire and a new vision in your heart? Yes, I see that hand. Yep. Yep. want a relationship with God, it's just this easy. Pray with me. God, I know that I've been trying to live my life my way. And I know that I have sinned against you in trying to do that and the mistakes that I have made. God, would you forgive me of all my sin? Would you help me to walk in the way that makes you pleased? In the way that you have put before us? In Jesus' name I pray. If you prayed that prayer, it's brand new today. Walk into that. Remember that. As we go into communion, like I said, I have two stations set up here. What I want to do is something just a little bit different. That you don't have to be a member of Living Hope Church to partake in communion. You just have to be a follower of Christ to participate. The bread that we use is gluten-free and we have the juice there as well. What I want you to do today as you prepare your hearts and your minds for what Christ has done for us so many years ago that we get to remember on a day just like this. I want you to come up as a family unit. Okay? You don't have to just follow rows if you don't want to, but, but come up to the station. And as a family, I want you to stand here. I want you to take the bread, take the cup. Eat it and drink it as a family unit, as a new start for this new 2017. Okay? On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he sat around one last time and had a meal with his disciples. And he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, This is a representation of my body, which I freely give for you. When you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And then likewise, he took the cup and he poured it and he gave it to his disciples saying, this is a representation of my blood which I am freely shedding for you. Take this and do this and remember that I have forgiven your sins from the past, from the present, and from the future for all time. And when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So don't hurry. Linger. Let God work in your heart and in your mind during this time. The band is going to play. And what I want to do is, I, because of the time, that I, I, I want to make this our closing. 
so that when you take the time to linger or do what you need to, come and have communion, and then you can go ahead and be dismissed at that time. Take as much time as you need. We are here for you. I am here for you to do that, okay? Pray with me one last time. Would you stand? God, I am excited to what you have put upon our hearts and our minds for 2017. I am excited that I get to be a part of Living Hope Church and that we get to affect the culture in Madison the way that you have put on our hearts. God, I'm excited for that and I can't wait. Help us to each have that burn inside of our hearts and our minds today as we move forward towards you. And let us not shirk back that maybe it's going to cost me too much, but let us stand boldly and move forward to what God has for us. God, I pray that you'd put a Mordecai in each and every one of our lives to encourage us to say, yes, you can do this. I believe in you. And let us walk forward. In Jesus' name, we pray all of this. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. As the band plays and as you see the, the song on the screen, feel free to come to communion as a family. i